Welcome to Three Count Commentary. This is your host, Mongo Slade, and today we're going to talk about April the 20th, 2021's NXT. Uh, this, I think it's the second NXT on Tuesday. Um, so let's get right into it. There's no news and notes that I can think of off the top of my head. So, all right, we, we start the show with Kyle O'Reilly. Uh, Kyle O'Reilly comes out and he's he's in a really good mood. He's wearing a jean jacket, which is, you know, oh, it's just, oh boy, people in jean jackets. Like if you're not a rough rider from 1999, don't wear a jean jacket. Anyway, uh, he was in a good mood because he didn't have to deal with Adam Cole. And then he said that he he's always believed that his work speaks for itself or spoke for itself. And that, but you know, during his feud with Adam Cole, he found out his killer instinct, and that's what you need to succeed. So he started saying like, "Hey, I have now have the the ability to challenge for titles." And he's like, "Do I challenge for the workhorse title, the North American Championship, or do I hunt the big game and say that you know, okay, well, Karrion Cross, you know, obviously Karrion Cross got something I want." Then here comes Cameron Grimes. Cameron Grimes, and Cameron Grimes comes in to pitch ideas you know first he gave his congratulations and then says that you know he's always he's made a killing off draft kings betting on <laughs> betting on kyle o'reilly and saying that uh you know Ky- kyle o'reilly <laughs> draft kings <laughs> said that they had you as an underdog i see you as the top dog and starts pitching these merchandising ideas the cool kyle collection of merchandise and NFTs, and he's got all of these great ideas, and uh, Kyle is kind of buying in a little bit, he's like, yeah, I like that, that's genius, we're business partners now, and Cameron Grimes was very excited about this, and then, you know, Kyle was talking about, oh yeah, I'm now, I'm, I'm, I'm cleared to wrestle, you know, now I'm, I, I'm looking for my opponent, and I think I see him, and then Cameron Grimes was, you know, looking around, and he's looking around, and he punched Cameron Grimes, obviously, right? So, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about the new Kyle O'Reilly, the the kind of jokey uh, Kyle O'Reilly. Like he's showing a little bit more personality, which I like. A little bit more swag, which I like. But I, I don't like this idea of everybody gonna stand in the ring and do jokes. Um, secondly, I want them to tell me why Cameron Grimes is a heel. You know, like. We saw Cameron Grimes be a bit of a bully when he got money at first, but now he's pitching legitimate business enterprises with these guys and they don't like him for it. It's like we, you have to explain why this is bad. Maybe if you pulled a, a gimmick where he does like a Matt Hardy where he wants the bulk of the money where he's kind of like, we're going to do these NFTs and if I'm going to get about 75%. You can get about 25%. I think that'd be good. And basically, he's like, what may have sounded like a good idea is messed up by him being a, a bumpkin that's trying to fuck you over. And I think that would get him over as a heel because, you know, right now he's comedic and he's talking about money, making money with these guys. And you don't see any reason why they wouldn't other than he's just a sleazy bastard, which is like, yeah, he could be sleazy, but he could still also be on the up and up. So I want them to lean more into why Grimes is a heel. Um, but cool Kyle that they're calling them now is, uh, that made me cringe. I'm not even gonna hold you up. That was crazy. So later in the show, we, uh, we get a ca- another Cameron Grimes promo where he claims he's going to put Kyle O'Reilly back in the hospital, <laughs> which was great. And then he reads this note about trying to get an NFT, but he got outbid in the auction by Ted DiBiase. Now this of course was spoiled online. That Ted DiBiase might be coming in to do a feud with Cameron Grimes. Uh, this sounds incredibly fun. This sounds like it's going to be excellent. Unfortunately, the internet spoiled it. Now, this this brings me to a situation that I, I've I've noticed. I hate to do this, but I've I've seen I started noticing this that nobody spoils anything on in AEW. Like AEW can tape a show, nothing will get spoiled. Nobody knows anything that happened. But NXT, you know, I don't think this show was even taped. And somehow the the surprise of 
of Cameron Grimes going to work with Ted DiBiase, even if it's probably just going to be promos and maybe Ted DiBiase has to have some type of avatar, some guy that he's going to, you know, be his, his stand in. It's been spoiled already. That seems very strange to me that everything in WWE is always, always spoiled. Everything in AEW, even if it's taped, is protected like it's in fucking Fort Knox. Now, that's very, that was very strange. I'm not one to complain, so I don't care. Um, I just think that it was weird that, you know, we didn't, that the episode of AEW Dynamite that was taped, there were no leaks. None. Not one. Nobody said anything happened. And you can't tell me that there was people in the crowd and nobody went in the crowd, told anybody else, and it ended up online? How is, how did that happen? They must be signing non-disclosures, because that's what they used to do in uh, Lucha Underground. And uh, that's basically where, I, basically where I was going with this. Is I'm just going to ask the question, is it that AEW asked their audience to sign non-disclosure agreements? I don't know. I don't, I've never been in the audience. But uh, I know Lucha Underground used to do that, that they used to have a, essentially a non-paid audience, but it, you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement that you cannot talk about what you saw. Um, even though they didn't know the storylines, the, the, the crowd, because it was a pastiche. They would tape a bunch of matches and then build the storyline around it and everything through editing and, you know, all that type of stuff. Um, but that was very interesting. Anyway, let's talk about this match. So Kyle O'Reilly is walking to the ring. And uh, he he sees Karrion Cross. They do the old stare you down in the hallway thing, which you know NXT kind of overuses. I would have liked if Karrion Cross maybe would have just come out there and took a seat and watched uh, Kyle O'Reilly. That would probably have been a little bit more my thing. You know, the guys just hanging out in the hallway. We've seen that a lot. Anyway, uh, Kyle O'Reilly and Cameron Grimes have a pretty solid match. Didn't feel like a main event though. Um, it just felt like it might have been the fourth match on the card. I don't know why it didn't feel like a main event to me. It just didn't come across like main event. And uh, maybe it's because Grimes is a great role player. He's not really a top guy. You know, like, I don't know what it's going to take for him to get to that level. But he feels like a great role player to me. And uh, maybe, I, maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Or maybe it's Kyle O'Reilly, you know, who knows? But I think Kyle O'Reilly's been in a high a high enough profile that he can break through and be a main event guy. Just not so sure it's the same thing for Cameron Grimes. Anyway, this match was really this match was good. Um I don't know how I feel about Kyle O'Reilly's finisher being a top rope knee drop. That kind of it's kind of a head scratcher because he's a guy who utilizes a lot of submissions. Why doesn't he have a submission finish? That should be, you know, top of the list. He should definitely be uh, going with a submission finish. They also should have ended the show with something hot. You know, uh, maybe another stare down between Riley and, uh, and and Cross. You know, maybe it's just the invisible wall between them and Cross saying TikTok. And as he turned around and goes back. Might have been a little bit better, you know, end with some, you know, or I saw you or something. But just ending the show after Kyle O'Reilly wins, he does a little bit of celebration and the show goes off the air. That seems weird to me. That's just me, though. <clears throat> That's just me, though. So um, we go back and uh, we get Saray. She's going to talk about her. Um, she's coming to the building. She's got an interpreter there or something to that effect. And William Regal meets her in the the vaunted NXT parking lot. And out of nowhere, you know, here comes Zoe Stark. Zoe Stark wants to be the first opponent for Saray. And William Regal asks Saray if she wants to do it. She's like, yes. And uh, that's the match. It was set up that Saray was going to make her debut. And her first opponent would be Zoe Stark. So, Saray. Where does my, what do I think about Saray? For starters, she's another very small, this one is actually very young, a Japanese girl. Uh, she's only 20, and she's five feet tall, uh, which is a problem because of what her finish is. Her finish is apparently a Saido suplex. She's five feet tall, okay? <laughs> when you get a finish, you should be able to do it on everybody. I'm pretty sure she's not going to be able to suplex Raquel Gonzalez. At least not without 
it's probably if Raquel Gonzalez does help her do this suplex, it's not going to be safe. Okay, so we're going to have to scratch that suplex you now um, as a finish. Other than that, this match was good. Um, it wasn't. I wasn't blown away, but it was good. Zoe Stark is impressive. I love the eighties aesthetic that she's got going on now, where she's wearing like hot pink and hot blue and stuff like that. She looks like a an eighties aerobic dancer, you know, like a like aerobics instructor from like one of those, uh, you know, where they were wear the white shoes with the white socks and it's always bundled up around the ankle with the, with the spandex. Like he, she needs to get like a headband, and that could be like her gimmick. <laughs> but but uh, she was smooth as always. Um, Saray was good. You know, um, I liked that they, they did a mixture of submissions and strikes. What I particularly liked about Saray was that she fired up, that, you know, she knew how to turn it on, you know, especially when it came to strikes. She laid her shit in, you know, and she looked good doing it, even though she was very small, you know. But uh, it was good. I didn't mind it. So after the match, after Saray wins, they hug. Zoe Stark and Saray hug. Um, our cherry lip paw goddess, Tony Storm, who has been gone for like, I don't know, what, three weeks? Two weeks, maybe? Um, it's been a while. You know, it's been so long. I don't know. She's wearing really tight pants, too. Oh, my God. Ooh. Anyway, she jumped. Uh, she jumped. Tony. She jumped. Tony. Tony didn't jump Tony. Joni. Tony Stark. Zoe Stark. God damn. Tony Stark and Tony Storm. It's driving my brain nuts. Iron Man and Cake Girl. Anyway, Tony Storm beat up Zoe Stark and threw up against the fence and kicked her a couple of times. And uh, Saray came out there to help her. And, uh, you know, I was like, okay. So Tony Storm is still stuck in NXT purgatory. Um, I guess she's going to be the next victim for Saray. Ah. Uh, Ah, I gotta tell you, I'm not thrilled about that one, dog. <laughs> I'm, I'm not thrilled about that one. Now, I do kind of want to see it because, I, again, I want to see what Saray can do. Um, Just not thrilled about Tony Storm being in that position. You know, she should honestly be somewhere else being a star. You know, that's just me. I've done videos about that already, and I'm not going to, you know, go through the you know, how much Tony Storm should be doing something else. All right, let me talk to you. We get L.A. Knight and his uh, now patented talking to us as he walks to the ring gimmick where uh, he complained about all the dummies, the dummy, yeah, who uh, attacked him during takeover and cost him the match. And then the biggest dummy, who he referred to as a crispy cross-eyed half-wit. <laughs> A creepy cross-eyed half-wit by the name of Dexter Loomis decided to put his hands on, on L.A. Knight. And now he's going to turn his, he said, I'm going to turn off your on switch. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> I'm a, he said he's going to turn off his on switch. I was like, okay, it, it, if it works for you, dog. So the first match on the show officially was uh, L.A. Knight versus Dexter Loomis. And, uh, you know, I like Dexter Loomis in small amounts. I don't think Dexter Loomis needs to be the main event or the opening of the show. Um, and I think they definitely put him in the ring too long, you know. Uh, but this match was solid. Uh, LA Knight is really good. They're not really giving him the best opponents, I don't think. Because they had him with Bronson Reed and Reed is... Meh. And now Loomis is... Meh. They need to give him with somebody who can... Who can banter with him uh, as far as his uh, his vo his vocal um, ability? They also should have just let him cut promos a little bit longer. You know, they should have let him do maybe a month of promos instead of doing two weeks of promo. You know, but whatever. Uh, Indy Hartwell comes out to the ring and she distracts uh, Dexter Loomis because she's flirting with him and giving him the googly eyes, and uh, it ends up costing him the match, even though. LA Knight completely botched his finish, which was supposed to be, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's caught up in the ropes. He was supposed to be caught up in the ropes and doing it. And it, it ended up being an absolute cluster. Anyway, LA Knight wins, which is the right decision. And, uh, Andy Hartwell comes over the barricade 
and she's, you know, wants to kiss Dexter Loomis. So she goes over to uh, the the ring and she's has to position herself perfectly at, to the back of the of the ramp, you know, and she gets up and she kind of you know, gives Dexter Loomis the eyes as he recovers from getting pinned. And then she puckers up her lips and he approaches and then the Garganos grab her from the ring apron and carry her away. Which, uh, you know, they're, they need to get this girl a chastity belt. You know, if she's going to be acting like this, she, she's like, she's in heat. She needs to get a chastity belt. So then later, uh, Indy Hartwell is asked about her trip with Dexter Loomis. Um, and uh, she, before she can answer the Garganos interfere, they interrupt. They say, nope, nope, nope. You're not going to be talking to whoever that was. I think it was Maria Schreiber. Is that her name? Uh, you're not going to be talking to him. And then, you know, Bronson Reed comes in and says, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that Dexter Loomis would be a good addition to the Gargano family. And I'm like, oh, cr cringe, bro. You just spoke cringe. And then Johnny Gargano is, starts to spaz on Bronson Reed. And Bronson Reed's like, oh, yeah, I want to be the North American champion, by the way. And, you know, uh, then Austin Theory's like, nope, nope, nope. You, you have to beat me to be the number one contender. Mr. Regal said so. And then Johnny Gargano's like, no, what are you doing talking to Regal? You shouldn't talk to Regal. You can't talk to Regal. And uh, it's already done. So the decision was made next week. Austin Theory versus Bronson Reed. If Reed wins, he gets a title shot. And then Johnny Gargano, of course, pitched a bitch about this. And he was very, very mad, very, very mad, very, very angry, very, very distraught. Uh, I'm, I'm tired of the Garganos, dog. Even things that might be entertaining, is it seems crazy to me. Let's continue with the Garganos because there was a lot of them on this show. Uh, Candace was giving Andy Hartwell a lecture, telling her she needs to stop being distracted by boys. And then Andy Hartwell was like, uh-uh, Dexter Loomis is a man. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was funny. And then uh, she starts talking about the, the women's tag team title. She wants the women's tag team championships. And then Dexter, Dexter Loomis peeks over this goddamn door. This door is like eight feet in the air. And Dexter Loomis is just peeking over the door. And of course, because, you know, he got caught peeking, you know, Indy Hartwell was entranced and went over to talk to him as, uh, well, let's back up because she wanted to be the women's champion. And this is this, this is the crazy thing. She said that uh, Andy Hartwell was like, why don't we just go ask Mr. Regal if we can, you know, get a tag team title match? And then Candice LeRae was like, no, like that doesn't work. Like talking to William Regal does not work. He's a saboteur. <laughs> Which I was probably the funniest thing I ever heard her say. Was that <laughs> she called this man a saboteur? Anyway, that was funny. Uh, she was lecturing and going on and on, and Indy Hartwell had pretty much walked off. And then she bumped into just happened by happenstance, of course. She bumped into Shotzi Blackheart and Indy Hart and uh, Ember Moon, who were, I don't know, drinking coffee, Gatorade, or whatever the hell. But they looked like complete and total dorks, like wearing their titles, just walking around. Like this, this. It's real dork shit, you know. <laughs> I just, I just can't imagine being in the back and everywhere you go, you got this goddamn belt on. Anyway, um, she was running her mouth to them, not noticing that Andy Hartwell had floated away to uh, be in the arms of Dexter Loomis, and uh, then she, I think she knocked the cups out of their hand or something like that to start the fight, and then they both proceeded to thrash and beat Candice LeRae. It was completely unnecessary. You know, they could have knocked her down and that was good for being a nut. But they really just kind of gang jumped her. And then they took her behind closed doors. Like like a scene from The Watchmen. They dragged her into like the bathroom and just beat her. <laughs> they just beat her. Like, like really? Like, this was... This was <laughs> what the fuck? So, uh, I was... I, was, I had question marks over my head at this point. Because I'm like, all right, is Amber Moon and Shotzi Blackheart the heels now? No, of course not. Obviously, they're not the heels. They were just retaliating for being attacked. But 
Come on, man. You didn't have to beat her that bad. Anyway, um, we get an, uh, yet another segment from the Garganos in which uh, Tony, well, in, well, I got Tony on the brain. I really do. Where Indy Hartwell is gushing about seeing Dexter Loomis. And Candace LeRae is torn. Her shirt's torn. She's obviously lumped up and dirty. Gargano was, was, you know, interrogating Austin Theory about this match with Bronson Reed. It's all not looking too good. And then, uh, you know, um, Indy Hartwell breaks the good news that Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell will get a tag team title match. Not for any particular reason, just because, I guess because they asked. I guess that's all you got to do is ask. You know, it's not like you have to win like a tag team title, uh, number one contendership. Is there any other tag teams as far as the women are concerned in NXT right now? You know, because Raquel Gonzalez is a single and, you know, they could have put uh, Saray in a tag team. They could have, you know, they could have done something, you know, but apparently now what the thing, the whole thing is, uh, it, this is, this is nonsense. Anyway, you get, you get my drift, right? My drift is there's no other tag teams. So <laughs> these two teams are just going to be fighting each other infinitum. Uh, again, there was far too much Garganos on this show. Far too much. Um, even the things that are funny with them, it's still so much of it that, of course, like if you're going to give them a thousand bites out of the apple, of course, they're going to mess around and get something funny. If you're going to give them like all the... You know, I, I appreciate that they're trying to, they've sold Johnny Gargano as a ring veteran for so long. Now they're trying to do it, you know, trying to sell his personality. Um, um, But I just, not, I'm not interested. I, I, I definitely like Johnny Gargano a lot more when he was just work rate guy. Now he's work rate guy who's trying to be funny. And I'm just kind of like, <laughs> big fat. <laughs> anyway, uh, too much Gargano's. Uh, Andy Hartwell and Dexter Loomis is cool though. I like I like that. Like the Dexter Loomis is because it's weird. Like it's it's so weird that it's interesting, you know. Because I want to see where it's going. Is it going to end with them two kissing on TV, you know? And where did where where do we go from there if that happens? Like, do we have Andy leave the way? You know, is that how we're gonna you know? But what does that do for Dexter Loomis to have Andy Hartwell hanging around with him all the time? Are we going to have him break her heart, you know, and send and create a different character for her? Because, you know, you have, if you break somebody's heart, you have to change the character. Um, only like the attitude error would somebody's heart get broken and their character wouldn't change. Even though I think that's kind of, uh, they did do that quite a bit in, in, uh, in the attitude error, but we'll see. I'm interested in that. I'm not interested in anything Johnny Gargano has to do. I'm not anything in the colossal Bronson Reed. I'm not, you know, he just sounds soft. That's all I'm going to say. He sounds soft. Let's jump back to the beginning of the show. Uh, Leon Ruff still wants to fight Swerve. I, I don't know. Whatever. Then we get uh, Io Shirai and Beth Phoenix. So Io Shirai and Beth Phoenix talk about her meteoric rise as she won the title and was champion for 300 days. And then uh, she lost the title. And, um, you know, Io Shirai was like, look, I'm one, eventually I'm going to get a rematch. But, you know, so Beth Phoenix was like, what are you going to do until then? And she's like, I'm going to rest. I was champion for 300 days. <laughs> you know, like, it's a, it's a tough schedule. It's a, you know, even though it was a pandemic and have to travel that much, but it was tough. Oh, this uh, was it, it. It was shot beautifully. It was very professional. I, I I really liked that. Frankie Monet comes in with her little dog. It's all on the desk, and she's interrupting. And uh, she comes in to introduce herself to Io Shirai, and says like, "Well, I overheard that you're going on sabbatical. And you're going on a little hiatus, and I'm going to tell you that hey, I'm going to fill your shoes as being the star of the women's division." And you know, she kind of makes a snide remark that about how she has better shoes anyway. And uh, Io Shirai starts really saying crazy stuff in Japanese and then punctuates her statement with, I like cats. And then, <laughs> which, <laughs> which, uh, which Taya is, well, Frankie, Frankie Monet is kind of perturbed. Like, what? <laughs> you know, like, whatever. You like cats. 
anyway, uh, Frankie Monet looked like a star here. As, as far as the way the way she was dressed, the way she was presented, um, the dress that she was wearing, it looked, you know, glamorous. She looked like she's trying to be the the character I think that she's going for, which is kind of like Hollywood. Like I said, she's she's coming across much like an, a, a a perfect companion to Miz and Morrison, right? Like she she fits that mold, where she's trying to come across a little bit like a starlet, and uh, with, with her little doggy and everything, and uh, it fits. Now I'm all I'm all this was actually so much better than her debut. Her debut was not good. This was good. You know, her interacting with Io Shirai was good because Io, you know, spouting off in Japanese and being very mad about Frankie Monet coming in there disrespecting her for starters. And then had the dog running all over the place. That's another one. So this was this was good. You know, I, I, I like this. I don't think you do this right out of the gate, though. I think you let Io Shirai take her sabbatical. And then maybe this is her first match back. You do Frankie Monet and Io Shirai. But you have to, you know, of course, let Frankie Monet build. Now, let's talk about Frankie Monet for a second. Because uh, Taya has been getting a lot of shit about the name. What's even worse, though, is that she's been responding to idiots talking about the name. Because she gave them the old stop complaining, just enjoy this evolution or some shit she said. Which, of course, people don't like. People do not like say when you say don't complain. They they don't want to hear that. The, the, the real reaction should have been, I chose the name. You know, there's a reason for it. There's a there's a reason behind it. You know, just let's see what we let's see what we can take it. I can make you love this. You know, you're going to enjoy this. Trust me. Um, and but she said, like, you know, basically stop complaining you know, I got this or whatever. Uh, yeah, these people are like decades in the business and they don't understand how dorky and clingy wrestling fans can be. Like these people are nuts, right? Like I've seen, like remember when Keith Lee had to change his theme song and people were like tweeting at him a hundred miles a minute about how WWE ruined him by changing his theme song and and yada, 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 and he needed to have his theme song back, and they made him change his gear, and yada, yada, and I was like, holy shit, I wouldn't want to be on the business end of that, those people are nuts, <laughs> they're nuts, and Taya decided to throw red meat to the nuts over the week, and I was like, look, probably not a good idea, don't respond, you know, <laughs> just, just don't respond, don't say anything, all right, so uh, that, that's that. All right, so um, the second match, I know I've been on here for almost a half hour already. We're only on the second match. Breezango wrestled the Grizzly Young Veterans. I hate Breezango. They were dressed like the Queen's Royal Guard with the goddamn bearskin hats. Man, I wish Grizzly Young Veterans, Grizzled Young Veterans, would have shoved those hats up their ass. No lube. And then threw them out of the CWC. Just throw them out the building. Get them the, get them the hell out of there. I hate Breeze Angle. It's time to break them up, man. This match was too long also. You know, I don't know how long it was, but it felt like it was the longest match on the show. Uh, we didn't need this. We didn't need it. It was too long. The right team won at least. But I I, I am going to start a petition, I believe. If, if I remember in the morning, we'll start a petition to break up Breeze Angle. I hate them. I, I, I can't imagine anybody who hates anything as much as I hate Breezango right now. They've been going on for like five years. It's enough. Enough is enough, dog. Enough is enough. All right. Uh, all right. I, I've covered all that stuff already. So we got Raquel Gonzalez. So Raquel Gonzalez is uh, the champion. And she's, you know, trying to cut this promo about, you know, Io Shirai. And she's going to be a better champion than Io. And then they started talking about contenders. And then, for some reason, Dakota Kai takes over the promo. And she kind of drags uh, Mercedes Martinez a little bit. And she's basically speaking on behalf of Raquel Gonzalez, talking about, we beat Io Shirai so bad. You know, we did this, we did that. And Raquel's kind of looking at her like, hmm? <laughs> like, what? 
But I see what they're doing. So basically, uh, Raquel Gonzalez just said, hey, you line them up, I'll shut them down. I don't care who who wants the shot, you know, bring them. Bring it. And uh, I was like, okay, they're really planting the seeds for the breakup. Obviously, it's probably going to be. Now, look, here's the thing. Here's the thing, man. And I, I should have mentioned this in my raw review, but the damn thing was so long that I, that it's just it was too much. They just had this big baby face thing with Raquel Gonzalez and Rhea Ripley. Now it's almost coming across. Now I think Raquel Gonzalez is still a baby face. She's just in the shadow of a heel. Because I think now Dakota Kai is going back to being a heel. Which you know, of course she should never have turned baby face in the first place. But um uh, same thing with Rhea Ripley. You know, where she just had this huge baby face moment and then she's kind of still heelish on Raw. It's kind of weird. You know, even though I, like, I couldn't tell what the hell Rhea Ripley was supposed to be doing on Raw. Like, she helped the babyface win, and she said Oscar was going to win, and Oscar was a better wrestler and all that type of stuff. But was that just dislike of Charlotte, or was that really her supposed to be a good good guy? I, I don't know. And here was similar. Like, we should have just had, you know, Raquel Gonzalez. Uh, and, I, and I get that they're trying to build this, again, plant these seeds. I needed them to, to show me that Raquel was more of a baby face and more of a badass. So um, I felt like that was one team. You know, they left me one team on that one. But then later, Mercedes Martinez says that she called out Raquel Gonzalez two weeks ago and she never she didn't respond. So she says, like, you know, are you scared? Are you hiding behind Dakota Kai? Are you scared of me? And then she says, how about this? How about I challenge Dakota Kai to a match? And I'm going to move her out of the way. So there's just nothing between us but the title. And I like the way it was shot. Because it was shot, you know, with the camera going up to uh, Mercedes Martinez. So she looked bigger than she really is. And uh, she's pretty tall already. I also like that she's also Latina. So they had the, the whole mixture of Spanish, Spanglish thing. You know, like I said, there's kind of a, there's a lot of similarities between the two of Raquel Gonzalez and Mercedes Martinez. And I actually like that. And uh, I also like that she's, she's also watering the seed of, you know, discontent between Raquel and Dakota by saying, oh, you Dakota's lap dog. You know, you're just yapping behind her like a little lap dog. And I was like, hmm, okay. Interesting, interesting. So, I'm interested in this. Uh, I'm interested in this. Raquel Gonzalez and Mercedes Martinez should be very fun. It should be very fun. Dakota Kai is obviously going to do the job next week, but that ought to be fun too. All right, so uh, what's the last thing? I know there's two more things I need to cover. All right, uh, one of them is Kushida versus Oni Lorcan. Cruiserweight Open Challenge. So, uh... Kushida says that he won the Cruiserweight title in an open challenge, and now he's going to give the same opportunity. So, only Lorcan. Oh, my God, bro. I love this match, for starters. Let's get that out the way. I love this match. Only Lorcan is, like, one part Walter, one part Cesaro. This guy, his chops. It sounds like you're getting hit with a plank. It, it, it's just, listen to them shits, man. It sounds like you getting hit with a plank. His chops sound like they hurt. His European uppercut looks like it hurts. It looks like you're getting hit in the chest with a corkscrew. It looks like it hurts. I love Oni Lorcan. He's really good. If they let him do his screaming guy stuff, that would be awesome. This was really good. Um, Kushida is now wrestling barefoot. He's gone complete and total Von Eric on us. Um, okay. They, Kushida won and now he's changed his character. Now he's got out of them goddamn jeans. Now he's in tights. Now he, he's gone without his boots. Now you're going towards a more mixed martial arts style presentation with Kushida, which is fine. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't mind that, but, uh, this match was really fun. I really enjoyed this. And uh, Kushida wins the match with the hoverboard lock. He had been working the arm the whole match. But uh, the viciousness of Oni Lorcan. 
my God, bro. If he was in a bigger body, I think we might actually have something with him. He's so intense. He's so serious. He lays his shit in, you know, and you don't need to do much with Oni. Oni could go in there and chop you to death. Match could be four fucking minutes and it'd be memorable as hell. But these two guys went in there and did it because Kushida laid his shit in too, especially his kicks. It was good stuff, man. And he used the, uh, the Shote palm strike, which I always like. I don't like it when Cheeseburger does it, but I like it pretty much anybody other than Cheeseburger using it. So after the match, uh, Legato del Fantasma jumped Kushida from behind and beat him down. And MSK ran down there to make the save, <clears throat> which is typical babyface stuff. So this, of course, set up the six-man tag next week. MSK and Kushida versus Legato del Fantasma. Um, I'm guessing they're tying some type of anchor around the ankle of Santos Escobar, where he's going to still be in NXT for a little while. But he might just be there to put over Kushida, and then he's going to leave, or maybe he's going to—he's not going to the next level because that's Kyle O'Reilly now. Now we know for sure Kyle O'Reilly is, you know, the next guy in line for Cross, and I'm guessing Reed is probably going to be the the next guy in line for Gargano. <clears throat> So just like Tony Storm, he's just a star that's stuck doing nothing because Triple H is pushing other guys. And it's not that he's pushing the wrong people, with the exception of Gargano. It's not like he's pushing the wrong people. He's just pushing other people. And he hasn't told a proper uh, personal story with any of these other people that he got. So the last uh, angle to talk about was Imperium destroying Everrise. Now, who cares about Everrise? Everrise rules, but who cares? They cut those great 80s style promos, but they don't let them talk. So, And this is the first time they've been on NXT in a long time, so who cares? Now, the interesting thing is that Killian Dane comes out during the match because he wants to get his hands on Fabian Eichner and Marcel Bartel for beating him up the previous week. Alexander Wolf is like, hey, look, man, no, don't do it. You, you can't do it. I'm not going to let you do it. And he's like, no, I'm going to get those guys. And it was interesting that Wolf and Dane did not fight, right? They were talking not, not peacefully, you know, but they were keeping their distance. They weren't trying to tear into each other like enemies. They were keeping their distance. These are two guys who know each other from sanity. So they're friends, essentially. Or they're friendly. They're not necessarily enemies. Then you had Drake Maverick come to the ring and he decks Alexander Wolf. Just bang, decks him. And Wolf, of course, sells it like he got hit in the face with a cannonball, even though Drake Maverick's like four foot nothing. And uh, so then Killian Dane grabs Drake Maverick and throws him to the side, just threw him out of the way. Basically, like, no, you can't hit this guy. I'm not going to let you beat this guy. I'm not let you, gonna let you fight this guy. Very interesting stuff. And then he carries uh, Drake Maverick off. So we got here a situation where there's a mutual respect between Wolf and Dane. Because they used to be stable mates. And Wolf is trying to wake up Dane. He's trying to wake him up. You know, used to be a monster. What happened to you? I think he's, well, he's German. Why would he sound like that? Anyway, he, uh, it was, it was an interesting dynamics that they got here. And I, I liked it, you know. I wish they would have given it a little bit more time. Just a little bit more time. But this was still very good. So NXT was mostly good. Uh, mostly enjoyed everything on the show. Looking forward to next week. Um, so I wish they... I wish I needed to change up the format. I don't, I don't need any more uh, 10 minute promos to start the show. They can also cut down some of the goddamn uh, comedy. Like, it's okay to have comedy on the show, but everybody doesn't have to do it. The same thing I said about WWE. Everybody doesn't have to do comedy. Uh, you know, like, I don't know, like, <laughs> why Kyle O'Reilly is starting to do comedy all of a sudden. But um, it was fun. Like, NXT has a lot of good role players. They have very few stars. And the people who, you know, I think that a natural audience, if they saw them, would gravitate to them, like Santos Escobar, like Tony Storm, they're not really used. And that's unfortunate, you know. Like, I think if you put, you know, Tony Storm first, 
you know, in, in these spots that she could really get that division over, you know, people respond to aesthetics, you know, there's a reason why for decades, people put supermodels in on the cover of billboards. There's a reason why, you know, there's, there's people out here who are pog whisperers. Why Tony Storm is not being out there for them is crazy. You know, Santos Escobar is a handsome guy. He's very well spoken. I think he's a good representative. He's not, he looks like a cartel boss, but that's not his character. You know, his car, his, <laughs> that's only the, the appearance of the character. He really is a high level family man, much like Roman, much like Apollo Crews, you know, where he's just, a, he's a really high level, respectable family man. That's something that we should be trying to sell to people in this time, even, even as a heel. Um, and look, I know it's cross his turn, but fuck, come on, man. You can do personal feuds. Um, do something else with these guys. We we can't have them just, we can't have all your good talent sitting on the bench. And then there's all of these guys that's on 205 Lives forever. Somebody like Kurt Stallion, who I think is really good, never really gets on NXT. You know, they also need some, I wouldn't say new blood or fresh blood to NXT, but they do need, because they always bring in new people. They need for Raw or SmackDown to give them some draft picks. Let's put it like that. You know, it's okay if you want to take certain people out of their next. You want to take Rhea Ripley? Okay, they'll they'll replace her with Saray or with, you know, Raquel Gonzalez or somebody. But they also need to send people back. You know, like they also need to send somebody back. Because NXT's roster is filled with people who are not ring ready. And you, they do need tag teams too. So if you're not going to do anything with Nikki Cross, send her back. You know, if you're not going to do anything with, uh, where's Catalina? Now, that's the second time I was saying her name in six months. You know, she's been, <laughs> where did she go? Why don't we have any female uh, luchadors? There's plenty in AAA. Some of them have been down there for decades. Why don't we have any female luchadors? You know, we should be trying to tear that that wall down. And I'm, they're more likely to be able to speak um, English than some of the Japanese women. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have Japanese women. I'm saying that we should balance this out by bringing in some female luchadors too. You know, um, and we also need to expand NXT to have give the women their own brand. Uh, I'm going to say it a hundred times to see if uh, it actually sticks. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's NXT. So if you want to subscribe to the channel, do so via subscribe star. Uh, thank you. Um, you want to send cash because you appreciated this video or any other video that I made. The cash app will be open. Uh, use the hashtag three count commentaries to follow all of the videos that I make uh, under the three count commentaries hashtag. You could also uh, follow me on Twitter via the uh, via the links in the description. Um, thank you. Please comment. Please. Uh, I read the comments and I also respond most of the time. If your comment is uh, something I think is you know interesting to respond to. Uh, also, uh, like and subscribe. Make sure you're still subscribed. Make sure you're subscribed, period. Hit the bell for notifications. Um, thank you guys for your time, and I'll talk to you guys later, man. Peace out. Oh, the castles here.